All right, so here we will learn about the period or the full stop. Now the period basically just marks the end of a sentence. And the period, very easy to learn about. Um, most people don't have a problem with it, but I want to go over it and show you a few other uses that maybe you don't know about or can learn a little bit about. Now in American English, we call it the period, but in British English, You'll hear, it, you'll hear it as a full stop. So, uh, as most people know, period is used to end a sentence. And these sentences are sentences that are facts or statements or commands or instruction. So you can see here we have a period at the end of all our sentences. And they're just simple sentences. The bag that she bought is quite expensive. Okay, this is a fact, a statement we use this period. The school promised to provide the students with free lunch every Friday. This is another statement, a fact. Get the ball outside. Command. Okay, just simple period. Read the instructions carefully. Period. Another way we can use these periods is for abbreviated or contracted words, right? Shortened words. And all you do is you take the abbreviated part, which is different for each word. Here, example is EG, and you put the period afterwards. Okay, general, GEN, period, company, CO, period, president, PRES, period. If the abbreviated word is at the end of the sentence, then you only need one period. You don't need a period for the abbreviated word and for the end of a sentence. Okay, so you can see just one period. He gave the apple to this mister. I owe this opportunity. I'm sorry. He gave the apple to this missus. I owe this opportunity to that mister. I work for Sun and Company. Okay, you can also read it as I work for Sun and Co. and people will understand. The spokesperson made a debate with the president. In American English, we always have a period after our abbreviated words, okay? Uh, but in British English, it's not required, so you'll see it without these periods. We do not use a period if we're using another punctuation mark, like a question mark or exclamation mark. Okay? So you'll see here, these are all incorrect. These are wrong. Why? Because here we're using a question mark. We don't need a period as well. Okay? Here we're using exclamation mark. We don't need a period. Again, not necessary. Okay, this is wrong. These periods must be removed. If we're writing indirect questions, which means these are questions that aren't directly asked to someone, Someone is telling you what someone else had asked them. You don't use a question or you don't use a question mark for these. You use a period. So she asked me if I would go to the party. Okay, this is an indirect question. This person is not directly asking you at that moment. They're telling you about when someone else asked them a question. So she asked me if I would go to the party. Period. She wonders what time the train leaves, period. Okay, so they sound like questions, but because we're saying that someone else asked the, this question, then it's an indirect question and we use a period. We do not use periods for a dependent clause. Now, what is a dependent clause? A dependent clause is just a group of words, but it's not a complete thought. Okay? It doesn't have the subject and predicate and object. It's not a sentence that can stand by itself. So we can't use a period with it. Right? So let's look at these examples. When she eats, period, she forgets her friends. Okay? This is not correct. When she eats is not a complete thought. It is not an independent clause. 
This is a dependent clause. So instead of a period, you can use a comma. So when she eats, she forgets her friends. Same with this one. Because of drugs, period, his life was messed up. Okay, this is not correct. Because of drugs is not a independent clause. It is a dependent clause. So we use a comma to fix it. Because of drugs, his life was messed up. And then we have a period at the end. Okay, same with these ones. Whenever she sings, the birds fly away. To make this correct, we use this comma. Whenever she sings, the birds fly away. While cleaning, okay, this is definitely not a complete sentence. So we add this comma. While cleaning, she removes the curtains from the windows. All right, so here we will cover the question mark. And the question mark is pretty easy to use. I'm sure nobody has any real problems with it. The question mark just comes after any question or query. The first time you'll use it, or the first situation you'll use it, is at the end of any direct question. So you can see here, these are all direct questions, right? How are you? Where will you go on Sunday? Have you ever been to a museum? Should we pay them a visit? However, if you ask, or not if you ask, if you are using an indirect question, and you're writing an indirect question, then you won't use a question mark. So these are all indirect questions. The student asked his professor about the lesson tomorrow. Okay, so here we're just talking about someone, the student, who asked someone else, the professor, and what they asked them. We're not using it as a direct question. We have no question mark here, just a period. I wonder if the school would provide us a new classroom. Okay, here's another indirect question. I wonder if she had a date. The family asked their neighbor about the new policy implemented in their town. Okay, these are all indirect questions. We will use question marks for something called tag question. And a tag question is when you have some declarative statement, which is just a normal sentence, you end with a period, but you turn it into a question by adding this interrogative fragment, okay, or this question fragment. So here we have some examples of tag questions. He is our president, isn't he? Okay, so here, he is our president, this is our declarative statement. Okay, normally this would just end with a period. But we turn it into a question by adding this tag question. So, isn't he? Which is ended with a question mark. Okay? And the tag question and our statement are separated with a comma. The next example. The kids are enjoying the view. Aren't they? Okay, same situation. Separated with a comma ends with a question mark. We should go hiking next time, shouldn't we? The school officers are not going to accept our proposals, are they? Okay, so this is how you use tag question. If you have a question mark for a quotation, okay, there's a few situations you'll learn here and also when we cover quotations, but here let's talk about if you have a quoted phrase or sentence that ends with a question, then the mark will go inside the quotation. Okay, if you have a full quoted sentence. However, if that quotation is in the beginning of your sentence, okay, so it's in the front, then the question just replaces the comma that you would normally put there. So let's look at these examples to see what that means. The teacher usually says, do you want to pass this subject or not? Okay, so here, our fully quoted question is at the end of our statement, okay? So we put the question mark inside the quotations. However, here, will you be my friend, Jerome asked. Here our quote is in the beginning, okay? It's mid-sentence, it's in the front. So here, the question mark is replacing that comma that we would normally have here if this was not a question sentence. 
Who is afraid of the manager? The secretary asked us yesterday. Okay, again, this is the same situation. The question mark is replacing the comma. My friend came here yesterday and said this. Do you want to watch a movie with me next week? So here we have the comma separating it. And the question or the quotation is at the end, so the question mark is included inside the quotation marks here. Okay, now let's talk about the exclamation point or exclamation mark. Now the exclamation point, okay, it's basically used to indicate a strong feeling or strong emotion. Okay, it could be any type of emotion, anger, joy, surprise, okay, or even some type of command. It's a way to express emotion in a written sentence. So the first way we can use it is to express a strong command or declaration. Okay, so here you can see, hey, I thought you left already. Okay, or ouch. My feet hurt a lot. Don't open the door. Hi. What's the matter? Right? These are all expressing strong emotion. Okay? Hey. Ouch. Don't open the door. Hi. When you see that exclamation mark, just think strong emotion. Now, when you use an exclamation mark, you're going to re replace the period. Okay? Or if it's in the middle of the sentence, you replace the comma. So let's see correct and incorrect versions. Don't forget your laundry. Okay? You don't use period and exclamation mark. It's just, don't forget your laundry, exclamation mark. Or, yes, I got the scholarship, right? Exclamation mark. Okay, so you don't use a comma here. If this was just normal, non-emotional, it'd be yes, comma, I got the scholarship. But we're using this exclamation here, so you shouldn't use a comma. Here, run. The dog is chasing us. Okay, this is correct. This is incorrect here. Run, right, exclamation mark, comma. You can't have these together. Or this one, watch out. Okay, just exclamation mark. This one here, incorrect. You can't have period and exclamation mark. You can also use exclamation points for something called rhetorical questions. And a rhetorical question is just a question that requires no answer. Okay, it's something that someone says, but they don't expect an answer. So these are all rhetorical questions. How can I ever thank you? Right? This is maybe someone says to something with lots of emotion, but they're not actually asking you to tell them how you can thank them. This is a rhetorical question. Okay? Or is this supposed to be a joke? Right? Maybe you're really angry and you say this to someone. You don't want them to say, yes, it's a joke or no, it's not a joke. It's a rhetorical question. And when an exclamation point is part of the title, okay, these commas are going to be kept. So let's see what that means. Peter wrote this exciting book, Don't Scream, comma, which became a hot topic in our discussion yesterday. Okay, so here the comma is part of the title. Okay, it's part of this title, Don't Scream. So it's going to be used still with this comma. This is one of the few times you'll see exclamation mark with some other punctuation. Or here, his title, Amaze Me, hit the public last week. Again, this exclamation mark is part of this title, Amaze Me. Okay, it's part of the title. That's why we're using the comma with it. For Gemma's recent essay, Run, was noticed by the board of directors. 
Okay, again, this comma is with this exclamation mark only because the exclamation mark is part of this title. All right, let's learn about comma. Now, one of the ways we can use commas is to separate ideas in a list or a series of words. Okay, so let's look at our examples here. The old lady bought us apples, oranges, and a pineapple this morning. So you can see here, we have a list. Apples, oranges, pineapple. Okay, so to break this list up, we use this comma. And it goes right after the word, then the space, and the next word. And this last comma here, right, very important that goes before and. Okay, so when you have a list, doesn't matter, three things, four things, five things, you always put and before the last item in the list. And that comma before the and needs to be there. Okay, so here you can see apples, oranges, and pineapple. You have a list of three things. So you have apples, comma, oranges, comma, then and a pineapple. Right? This is how you use commas in a list. The second sentence, I should share my cards, pens, papers, and erasers to my siblings. Right? So we have one, two, three, four things in this list. After each one, we have a comma, comma, comma. Before the last item of the list, we use and, but we still have that comma right before and. Okay? So remember, these commas are like pauses. So I should share my cards, pause, pens, pause, papers, pause, and erasers to my siblings. And it can be with more than just words, right? If you have a series of clauses, or a list of clauses, or a list of phrases. So let's look here. The schools promised the students that it would provide the campus a water refill station, comma, that it would build an extra lane for the handicap, comma, and that it would provide a free lunch every end of the month. So you can see here, we have three clauses, right? Between, or right before the last clause, we have that and, and the comma. Here we have it with phrases, okay? His mom takes a lot of time to cook bacon, comma, to toast bread, comma, and to prepare his milk. Okay, so here we have three things. Right before the last one, we have and, but we're still using that comma before the and. Okay, so remember, that comma, right, we're always using it before and. Okay, this is called a serial comma or an Oxford comma. Okay, you'll see it called different things, but it's very important to have. And if you don't have it, it can change the meaning of your sentence. We can also use comma to describe a subject. Okay, with two or more adjectives of equal rank. Okay, so this is useful when you want to use more than one adjective to talk about some person or something. Okay, so let's see in the example. He owns a well-behaved, responsible pet. So here we have this pet being described by this adjective here, responsible, and this adjective here, well-behaved. Okay, we use this comma between the two of them so that we can use both of them. Now, remember, these adjectives are of equal rank, means they're similar. So that means we can switch the order, it's fine. It could be like this, he owns a responsible, well-behaved pet. Okay, either one is fine. We have this sentence here, that kid is an all-around motivated student. Okay, so we have all around and motivated are the adjectives. We're breaking them up with this comma. Okay, but again, these are equal rank. They can be in any order, so we could switch them if we wanted. That kid is a motivated all around student.
here we go continuing with the multiple adjectives i like a sensible mature discussion or i like a mature sensible discussion okay the important thing is we're using this comma to break the adjectives apart the employer wants to develop his overly shy passive employee or the employer wants to develop his overly passive shy employee okay remember this is with adjectives that are of equal rank some adjectives have an order okay for example if they're adjectives of size or quality there's a certain order that they have to go in but adjectives of the same type can be interchanged okay we can also use commas for adverbs just like we did with adjectives so here let's look at the examples he drove the car hastily noisily and effort effortlessly okay he drove the car hastily noisily and effortlessly so here we have three adverbs and we're breaking them up like a series or like the list that we did before with commas and the word and my pet wags its tail slowly gracefully and beautifully the student listened to the discussion calmly quietly and thoroughly for sure, the government warned the citizens peacefully, gently, and passionately. Okay, so this is a nice way to include more than one adverb. We can also use commas to join independent clauses. Okay, and in case you're not sure, an independent clause is a clause that can be written by itself as a simple sentence. Okay, it has a subject and a predicate with an object. So here are examples. I would like to buy pizza. Okay, this is a full sentence, simple sentence. I think my family would love to have one. Here we have two independent clauses. So we can use a comma to join these. I would like to buy a pizza, comma, and I think my family would love to have one too. So here we use this comma and the word and. Okay, the second one sounds much better than writing like this. Okay, this is choppy. Okay, when you write short little sentences like this, it doesn't sound very good. So just by adding this comma and the word and, it flows much better. Okay, it makes your writing sound better. The next example, he is extremely tired. He needs to get home as soon as possible. Okay, here we go again. We have two independent clauses. Let's join them. Two, he is extremely tired, so he needs to get home as soon as possible. Okay, again, just by using this comma and this conjunction here, we made our sentence sound much better, okay? More examples here with independent clauses. I am aiming to get an A star. I am struggling with my mathematics subject. We can combine these two. I am aiming to get an A star, comma, yet I am struggling with my mathematics subject. Okay, again, just a more complex sentence looks better, better writing. Okay, that's the goal. You want to learn more and more punctuation so that your writing can improve, it can look better. People read your information and think highly of you because of your writing. The last example, today is Sunday, the test is on Tuesday. Combine these, today is Sunday, and the test is on Tuesday. Don't forget these commas before each time. Now, if the two clauses that you join together are very short, we don't necessarily need a comma. Okay, so if it's a very short, independent thought, okay, just a verb, and a subject and an object. We can just join them together without the comma. So, for example, if we had two independent sentences, he dances, she cooks, and we want to join those together, okay, with this word while, we don't need a comma. We can just write, he dances while she cooks. Okay, again, I eat, she cleans, can join together without a comma. I eat and she cleans. I am busy. He left me alone. Okay, very short. 
they'll just join without the comma. She talks, the kids laugh, two independent sentences, join together, but no comma. Okay, now we can also use commas to join independent clauses to a dependent clause. Okay, now a dependent clause is an incomplete thought. It cannot be written as a sentence by itself. And these dependent clauses, a lot of the times, you'll recognize them through certain markers, like after, although, because, and so on. Let's look at some examples. Because of the heavy rain, okay, this by itself, you can't write as a sentence. This is a dependent clause. But we can join it with a comma to an independent clause. Classes were canceled. So the full sentence, because of the heavy rain, classes were canceled. Okay. Next, after going through a hard time, he became more decisive and independent. So here in the bold is the dependent. This is the independent, joined by the comma, okay? And you can see, because, after, although, these are all those markers. Although the event was successful, most of the VIPs did not even congratulate us. And the last example, as the days go on, we begin to think maturely and wisely. Now we can also use commas okay, to set off, which means to make something stand out or to include some type of extra descriptive word or phrase. Okay, so if you have some type of non-essential information, now something that's not necessary, but it's helpful to add it in to make things clear, okay, then we can add these with commas. So let's see how we do this. James, who is Jane's brother, won the spelling competition. So here, our non-essential information is this, who is Jane's brother? Okay, and you'll notice it starts with this who. Okay, many of these always start with some type of relative pronoun, who, whom, whose. Okay? But the important thing to note is that we separate them with these commas. Okay? If I take this out, the sentence would still make sense. James won the spelling competition, right? That still makes sense. But I can add this extra information. James, who is Jane's brother, won the spelling competition. Here, Jane and her friends, who spent three days fishing, are back in school again. Again, Jane and her friends and are back in school again. That's one complete sentence, right? It's fine. But we can add this extra information here by blocking it out with these two commas. My cup, which has a black cover, fell and broke. Right? Just extra information. Jonathan, my cousin's fiance, is inviting us for dinner. We'll also use commas to indicate introductions. So these are these introductions that we're talking about, okay? It's the beginning of when you start to speak. This is the introduction we're talking about. Maybe someone asked you a question, okay, or it's the first time someone is speaking. These words are introductory words. We use a comma after them. So, for example, yes, why not? Okay, so this is yes is the response. It's the first time that you're beginning to speak. We use a comma. Or, sure, that'd be great. No, you can't attend the party. Honestly, I didn't really like the food. Okay, so this comma, there's a pause. So all of these are initiating or starting your thought. When we have transition words, we need to use commas. Okay, these Transition words are words that connect ideas in a sentence. 
so it makes it more logical and easier to read and understand. The example, the characters in the book faced a dilemma. However, they overcame it with teamwork. Okay, so this however would be a transition word, and it needs this comma. The result was successful, hence he got the scholarship. Okay, so this transition word, right? These words link the first and the second piece of information. It seems like a happy place. Likewise, the people appear to be kind. The students have attended a series of events. In particular, they have experienced water-related activities such as boating and kayaking. Okay, again, make sure you have this comma. We can also use commas to set off names or nicknames, okay, or a title. So just like before, when we set off actual phrases of information, we can do it with names and titles, right? So yes, good friend, I will do it just like the old times, okay? So this is extra information. It's their name, their title, their nickname, okay? Will he, John? open the gate okay so we're talking to John so we're saying will he open the gate but by saying John it's directing it more at him will he John open the gate or I will meet dad my old man at the airport why would you my president offer me this position okay so you need to when you read it aloud or speak it like this, you need to keep those pauses in there. That's what the effect is for. That's why you're writing with these commas. And next here we have commas using days and months and years. Okay, so when you write the date, these commas are needed to separate it. So let's look at these different examples to see where the commas go. Okay, so the research commenced last June 23rd, 2019, okay? So here you can see June 23rd. So when you have the month and the actual date, 23rd, 24th, okay, these go together as one unit. Then the comma comes after, followed by the year. We should visit Hong Kong on December 1 or December 1st, 2019 again the month and the actual date okay together is one unit then a comma followed by the year let's look at this one the store stopped the promotion last wednesday may 8th 2019 okay so here we're separating the individual day or which day monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday okay that's what we mean when we're talking about day from the month and the date, right, May 8th, remember this is a unit, this counts as one, comma, and the year, 2019. Here we have, my parents will take the bags tomorrow, July 8th, 2019, okay? Here, tomorrow is a day, right? Tomorrow is the next day. So we have this comma here, July 8th is the month and the date together followed by another comma, and the year. We will use commas for writing addresses, okay, and names, their titles or professions. So, very quickly, let's look through these examples, okay. Kelpagadin, that's the name or the place. North Jakarta, okay, Indonesia. So, you're separating each area with a comma. Odi Street, comma, okay. Cornaldo City, comma, Philippines. Okay, we're going city, or sorry, street name, city name, country name, right? All separated by commas. Here we have actual people. James Owen, his name, comma, mathematics professor, title. Pauline Mendez, comma, 
internal medicine, okay, profession, her job. And we can also use commas to be used to enclose the degree titles. So, Johan Mindel, comma, PhD. Oscar Smith, comma, MD, right? These are the titles of their degree. James Cooper, MESL. Daisy Johnson, MAED, okay? So this comma separates the title and the name. Commas are used to introduce direct quotations. Okay, a direct quotation is a quotation that is directly said by someone. So our example, John said, put all the buckets in the room. After John said, you need this comma before the quotation. Here, St. Marcellin said, comma, and then your quotation. To educate children, you must love them. Here, I dislike parties, comma, Jane proclaimed. Okay? But you need to notice something here. The first two are the same, right? Whoever said it comes first. In this situation, the comma comes right after said, and it's outside the quotation. But this third example, right? The person who said it, or here proclaimed it, is after the quote. And the quote is before. In this situation, the comma goes inside the quote here at the end. Okay, so the comma goes inside the quotation marks if this part is after. But if whoever said it is before, the comma goes here outside the quotation marks. And if we use a quotation with a question mark, okay, we don't use a comma if it's a question mark or even exclamation mark. All right, here we'll talk about the semicolon. Now, semicolons are used a lot like commas or periods. Okay? So you'll have a little pause whenever you see a semicolon. It's going to be stronger than a comma, but not as strong as a period. So semicolon is used in a similar way as a comma and period, and we'll see how we can use it. Okay? But the main way you use semicolon is to connect two closely related ideas or clauses, and you use a semicolon so that you don't have to use a conjunction. And to be honest, when you write with semicolons, it makes your writing look very sophisticated or advanced. Many people are scared of semicolons, but really they're not that hard to use. And when you do use them, people think, oh, this person is a good writer because they know how to use semicolons. So our first look at semicolon is to link closely related independent clauses. Okay, so you're relating two independent clauses that are related. And we can see here, some people like to use Windows computers, others like to use Apple. Okay, so here we have a semicolon. Now, you could have used a period, okay, it would have been fine, but the semicolon kind of connects these two ideas. So it's all one big idea, but the semicolon is a punctuation mark that lets us separate them. John went to take a shower, Jimmy went outside to buy pizza. Okay, so if you use the period here, then there's no connection. We don't know that there's a connection. Maybe you're just telling me two separate facts, but here John went to take a shower, Jimmy went outside to buy a pizza. Because it's a semicolon, that tells me that these two things are related. Okay? Maybe you're saying, at this time, this is what John did, this is what Jimmy did. Here, I ordered hamburgers for our snack. It is nice to have fast food once in a while. Okay, again, these two ideas are related, they're connected. We have paid all our bills. We expect a good service from our house complex management. Okay, so this quotation here, remember, it replaces conjunction. So if we put a period here, 
maybe we would have to use so we expect a good service, right? But because this, con this semicolon is here, we already know these two, uh, these two are linked. We don't have to use some conjunction. And again, remember, like I said, these semicolons, they replace these conjunctions or conjunction adverbs that we might use in a sentence. So let's look at some examples with conjunctions and then what they look like without the conjunction. So I saw some people wearing red shirts in the restaurant and they were all eating the same food. Okay, so this is fine, but we have to use a comma and a conjunction, right? We always have our comma before the conjunction. This is fine, no problem with it, but if you want to look, like I said, sophisticated, fancy, better writer, you can use this semicolon to get rid of this comma and conjunction. I saw some people wearing red shirts in the restaurant. They were all eating the same food, okay? These ideas are linked. We got rid of the conjunction and comma. Just another way to write, okay? And you don't want to get too used to writing only in semicolons, right? Or only in commas and conjunctions. A good writer will know how to mix it up and when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. His friend got into trouble, so his mom was furious. Okay, or mum. You can say mum or mom. Same thing. His friend got into trouble, so his mom was furious. With a semicolon, his friend got into trouble, his mom was furious. Okay? So, I don't know about you, maybe you haven't seen semicolons a lot, but Whenever I see a semicolon, my brain automatically already kind of thinks about this conjunction, right? Just by seeing the semicolon, I can already think this in my head. So that's the use of semicolons. Okay? They save us writing, but they're very useful in telling us the link between these things. The company advertised new products, and customers are going crazy over them. Okay, all we have to do, put a semicolon, just take out the comma and the conjunction. I like to own a few pets, and I am hoping my friends will give me some. Again, just take it out the comma and the conjunction, use a semicolon. Okay, and another way we can use these is if you want to include some type of transition word, okay, or a conjunctive adverb, then you can structure it like these examples. So let me show you. A heinous crime happened near my city. Hence, all police officers are on full alert. Okay, so here we have the semicolon and we have this transition word okay, with a comma. So this is how you will structure it. He accidentally broke the expensive glass. As a result, his phone was confiscated. The family went to Bali. Moreover, they rented a private villa near a beach. His experiments failed, hence, he was worried about his scholarship status. Okay, now, these extra words, hence, as a result, moreover, okay, hence, you can add these, they're fine, but if you take them out, a heinous crime happened near my city, all police officers are on full alert, right? That works too, so this is just an option. Now, this is a different use for semicolons, and this is to help make a long list clear or less confusing. So let's look at these examples. You can see here, there's a lot of text, right? Looks confusing already. So let's see how we use the semicolon. My friend likes to buy lots of stuff. Okay, this is a colon, as we're making a list. A red shirt, the one from Zara's limited edition, semicolon, okay? So here you can see, we have a comma here. This comma is to separate the description of the red shirt, right? A red shirt, the one from Zara's limited edition, is used with this comma. So if I had another comma here to separate the list item red shirt from this next list item jeans, that would be very confusing. So here I'm using this semicolon to separate the list items because I'm using commas within each item. So hopefully that makes sense. 
right? We can see this one here. So this semicolon ends the first item, which is the red shirt. The next item is the jeans, comma, from the newly released collection from True Religion, okay? Semicolon. So the second list item is this part, the, je the jeans. First one is the red shirt, okay? But because we're using commas within the list items, we use the semicolon to separate the full list item. Our next example here, okay, Jonathan, Jusa, and Levy, okay, or Levy, 2005. Right? So here we have commas separating all of these names and the year, but this whole thing together is one list item. So we're using a semicolon to separate all of these instead of a comma, because we're already using many commas. Okay, so take a look at these. This last one is a little different, right? My school has different departments, okay? English, chemistry, physics, and combined science, arts, and foreign languages. Okay, so here, even though we're just using English as one item, and we use a semicolon, because we're using a semicolon here is for this reason. There are list items where we do use commas. But we have to keep it the same throughout, even if it's just one word in the list item. All right, and the last thing I want to make note of is that when you do use these semicolons, don't capitalize the first letter of the second sentence. And these aren't periods. Read it more like a comma. That you're not capitalizing that first letter. So here in our examples, the first version is incorrect. Why? Because we have this letter capitalized. Okay. Look at the second version. I am here, he is there, lowercase. Okay, so all of these have an incorrect version with a capital letter, and then the correct version is lowercase. So take some time to look at these. And again, remember, the reason we're using this semicolon is these ideas are linked. Okay, they have a relationship with each other. Okay, in this lesson, we're going to go over the colon. Now, the first use of the colon is to present an item or a series of items. Okay, kind of like a list. And when you use this colon, okay, the word that comes after it does not need to be capitalized. Let's look at these now. The first example, the kids know what must be done, colon, listen. Okay, so here we have this sentence here. The kids know what must be done. And then we use this semicolon to present the very short list, right, or a series of items, the things that must be done. And as you can see, we do not capitalize the first letter. Okay, it's not like a period where we're starting a new sentence. Let's look at something that's a little bit longer. Here we have, for the event, everyone is required to bring basic camping materials, colon, rope, poles, water bottle, and a lighter. All right, so we have our main sentence here, and then the colon starts this series of items that are needed from our first sentence here. So you can see again, okay, the R is not capitalized. We use regular punctuation after the colon with our commas. Okay, so this is very useful when you want to write a list of things and you don't want to make extra sentences to make your writing longer, more bulky. Okay, very important way to make your writing look better. Let's go through the rest of these examples real quick. We are looking for a secretary who can do the following. Type reports, edit manuscripts, and proofread articles. Okay, so here we have our series of items. Okay, so the, your items can be nouns, they can be verbs, they can be phrases, it doesn't matter. But you can see we have our semicolon, and the first letter is not capitalized. Our next example, I went to the market and bought lots of vegetables, carrots, spinach, potatoes, and cabbage. Okay, so again, we have a list of things, a series. Our last example, 
she got what she expensively paid for, a black diamond. Okay, so here we're using this semicolon, or I'm sorry, not semicolon, this colon to kind of add emphasis to this black diamond, right? She got what she expensively paid for, a black diamond. Now, where you put the colon does matter, okay? So, for example, you cannot put a colon directly after a verb. You can't say, I like, and then make your series of lists, apple, oranges, and pineapples. This doesn't work. Or you can't say, I must try, and then say all the things you want to try. Okay? You can't put this semicolon just after a verb. I'm sorry, I keep saying semicolon. You can't put this colon after a verb, right? Instead, you need to change your first sentence so that you can use the colon. Okay, so if we go back real quick, I like, and then apple, oranges, and pineapples, right? We can change that to, I would love to try these fruits, and then use your colon and list what you would want to try. Okay, so here the colon is after fruits, the noun, instead of the verb. Okay, the second example, let's go back. We had, I must try. Okay, that's not okay. So we can change our sentence to, here's a list of what I want to try. Now, you might say, well, hey, wait, it's after try again. And here it was after try, you said this is not okay, right? But here we have it as the phrase, I want to try. So these are things I want to try. It doesn't mean you're, it's not a verb, right? Here, I must try. Try is the verb. Here it's not being used as a verb. Okay? Next we have this third one. We had I want, and then our series of items. We change it to this. Extreme activities are my favorite. And then we listed those activities. Okay, so you have to change your sentence around a little bit in order to use these colons. And the last one I want to buy is what we wrote, but if we change it to something like this, my mom asked me to buy a few things, and then our list of things, okay? So remember, these colons have to be after something that is not a verb. All right, so now we're going to look at um, this special structure here where you're making this list one by one, okay? So when you're listing one by one, the colon can be used, but here capitalization, okay, and punctuation, like periods, are optional, okay? When the words before it are letters, numbers, or phrases. Okay, so if you're using letters or words or phrases, the capitalization and punctuation is optional, right? But if you use a complete thought in your list, then you have to capitalize and use full stop punctuation. And we will go over this now so you can see, okay? Let's look at this one here. These things we need to do, okay? And again, you might say, wait, do is a verb, right? But it's things that we need to do. So here, to do is not being used as a verb. We have this list now, one by one. Check papers, write reports, create a spreadsheet. Okay? Capitalization and end punctuation is optional because these are just phrases. They're not a full complete thought, okay? They can't be made into a full, complete sentence. Let's look over here. These are the rules our homeroom teacher posted. Do not use phones. Listen to the instructions. Make sure to close the door all the time, okay? These are not necessarily a complete thought, 
right? So it's optional, okay? We're using our own choice here if we want to capitalize and use this in punctuation, but because these are very close to a complete thought, right? They're kind of commands. We're going to choose to capitalize the letters and add the in punctuation, okay? Over here, here are the things they need. Detergent to wash the clothes, gloves for planting the trees, and empty bottles for decorations, okay? Again, not necessarily a full complete thought, right? Not with subject and object, but close enough. So we're going to treat it like one and capitalize these letters and add the end punctuation. Over here, make sure to get these things inside your bag, right? We have the colon, and then we have our list, a sunscreen, a cap, and a notepad, okay? Here, these are just words, right? So we're not capitalizing, we're not using punctuation. We can also use a colon to replace a period or a full stop in certain situations. So here, the colon is used between two independent clauses, okay? If the second sentence paraphrases or shows ideas or adds information from the first sentence. And when you do this, the word after the colon should only be capitalized if you have two sentences following it, okay? So let's see what this means. Here's the first one. I seldom eat my breakfast, colon. My new job gives me a very hectic schedule in the morning, all right? So because these two sentences are related, I seldom eat my breakfast, okay? And my new job gives me a very hectic schedule in the morning, right? So these are connected. I seldom eat breakfast, why? Because my hectic schedule. So we're using this colon to join these two ideas together. Okay? It expands further information. And you'll see this second one is just one sentence, so we don't capitalize the M. He believes in miracles. He talks to the statue of a saint near the church every day. Okay, so these two sentences are connected, right? They're expanding. The second one is expanding on the first sentence, so we can use this colon. And again, we don't capitalize this first letter. Okay. My company hired many new employees. They are expanding their business. So these two sentences are related, right? They're expanding further information. We use this colon, not capitalized. The new system shocked everyone. The digital feature made everyone novice. Again, colon, not capitalized, okay? But remember, here we said, if there are two sentences following it, we capitalize. So that means, for example, right here, the new system shocked everyone. The digital feature made everyone novice. If I had another sentence after that, nobody knew how to use it, something like that. Okay, so if there were two sentences afterwards, then you would capitalize this letter. Now, if a complete quoted sentence follows a colon, then you are going to capitalize the first letter. Okay, so here, if you're using a quote, the guest speaker made a good point. Life never depends on others. We use this colon, but because this is a complete quote, we capitalize that first letter. My mom, okay, or mom, depending on where you live, used to say this all the time. I should think positive at all times. Again, complete thought, it's a quote. We capitalize that first letter after the colon. Here, my teacher said this, it's better to repeat than to cheat. Okay, complete quote, colon, capital letter. Bill Gates famously said, life is not fair, 
get used to it. Again, this is a quote, right? So we took it from someone. We have quotation marks. It's after a colon. So we capitalize this first letter. Okay, and this is referring back to when we talked about earlier the two sentences. Okay, so here, if information after the colon needs two or more sentences, then you must capitalize each letter. So let's look. There are things that you should never do. Think negatively, bully others, cheat on exams. Okay? So here we have more than one sentence okay, or phrase after the colon. So we do capitalize each beginning letter. Here we have, I think I have to make some announcements here. Live healthily. Be happy all the time. Okay, so two sentences, which means we're going to capitalize the first letter after the colon. There are simple rules in life. Go after the things you like. Always ask. Step forward. So here we have three phrases. So we're going to use capital letter after the colon. My dad said this to have a happy life. Use things, not people. Love people, not things. Okay, so again, we have these two sentences or two phrases. And that means we have to capitalize that first letter after the colon. Okay, and lastly, we have sort of a simple use for the colon. But after any type of salutation, which means like a greeting, Okay, um, when you're writing some type of formal letter or email maybe, okay, then you're going to use a colon. If it's informal, normally you use a comma. So, for example, dear Mr. Hall, colon, okay, this means that it is a very formal letter, maybe for a job interview, application, something like that. Or dear Mrs. Clooney, okay, again, colon. These last two have commas after, more informal. Hi, David, or Dear James, right? Maybe you're responding to a coworker's email or writing an email to a friend. Okay, they're less formal, so we use the comma. All right, in this lesson, we will cover apostrophes. Now, apostrophes are used for many things. The first use for apostrophes Okay, is to show ownership. So we use apostrophes to tell someone that this is owned by a person or animal, something. Okay, so for example here, when you have a singular noun, okay, we're going to add apostrophe s at the end of the word to show ownership. So here we have these four examples. Okay, let's just look at them real quick. Here we have man's pet. So we have the man with apostrophe S, okay, and pet. So whose pet is it? It's the man's, man's pet. That is the man's pet. Here we have Miggy. Okay, Miggy is a person, it's their name. If we want to show that this is Miggy's bag, all we do is add this apostrophe S. So Miggy's bag. Miggy's bag was lost when he went to the festival. And again, here we have boss. Okay, boss's cap. Okay, so you can see, even though we have S here, we still add this apostrophe S. So boss's cap. Okay, he thought that his boss's cap was bought from the city's market. And then here we have Mon's mug. Okay, Mon is a person. Apostrophe S shows us that this mug is Mons. Mons mug has a colorful design. Okay, now here we're going to talk about regular plural nouns. Plural means more than one, right? So if we put the apostrophe on a plural noun, we're going to put it at the end of the noun. So our first example here, we have the word boys, right? This means 
more than one boy. So we put the apostrophe at the very end, no extra s, and then we have this habit. So the habits belong to a group of boys. It's the boy's habit. So the boy's habits make me feel uncomfortable. Same here, rabbits, right? This is a plural noun, rabbits, as in more than one rabbit. And it's their fur we're talking about. It's the fur of the group of rabbits. So her carpet is made of rabbit's fur, okay? It's not one rabbit, it's many rabbits' fur. Here we have buses, and again, the apostrophe is at the end by itself. So this is a plural noun, right? We're talking about more than one bus. So the bus's trips move outside of the city. This means that the trips of the more than one bus, right? The group of buses, their trips move outside the city. The trips belong to the buses. Okay? And again, buses can't own trips, right? They don't actually own them, but it connects these trips to the buses. Here we have tables covers. Okay? And we know we're talking about more than one table because the apostrophe is at the end by itself. So the table's covers. And our example sentence, I made sure that the table's covers were stain free. So again, the covers are referring to the group of tables. So maybe we're in a restaurant, we're talking about all of the tables. Now, if we have an irregular plural noun, okay, so an irregular plural noun is a noun that doesn't follow the normal rules of singular and plural. In this case, we will add an apostrophe s to the end of the word. Okay, so let's look at this closer in these examples. Here we have the word bacteria. Okay, bacteria is an irregular plural noun because Bacteria, just that word by itself, bacteria, means more than one, right? It's not bacterias. We don't add an S to the plural of bacteria. So it's an irregular plural noun. So in this case, we do add an apostrophe S, okay? Just like we did with the singular. So here it's bacteria's invasion, the invasion of the group of bacteria. So our example sentence, due to the bacteria's invasion in his tooth, the doctor decided to remove it. So here, okay, this might look like a singular noun, but this is something that you just learn over time. Bacteria is an irregular plural noun. Okay? Bacteria means more than one. Here we have media's influence. Okay? So again, media is an irregular plural noun. Media means more than one. So the media's influence, we're going to put this apostrophe S. The result of his depression was because of the media's influence over his popularity. So again, here, media means plural. We're talking about all of the different news channels and newspapers, okay, all of the media. Here we have women, right? Women means more than one woman, okay, so a group of women. And here we have issues. And because this is irregular, we put this apostrophe S. It's the issues of the women, the group of women. His article focuses on women's issues. And last, postman, right? Postman is the irregular plural noun version of postman, person who delivers your mail. So it's the postman's jacket right? Postman's jackets are usually made of leather. Now, if you have a noun that is a singular compound noun, we're going to take that apostrophe s and place it at the end of the word, okay? But if you have a plural compound noun, then you have to change the noun into plural first, and then add the apostrophe s. 
Okay, very simple. So here we have sister-in-law's charger. So take a look at this and let's see if we can figure it out, right? Sister-in-law is the compound noun. And we have an apostrophe S at the end. So that means this is singular. So the charger belongs to the one sister-in-law. Same with this one, mother-in-law, okay? Mother-in-law, apostrophe S, means just the single mother-in-law. We're talking about an individual mother-in-law. And the car belongs to this mother-in-law, so mother-in-law's car. But these last two examples, okay, what you'll notice here is we changed this part of the noun here, okay, fathers and brothers. We added this S here. We didn't add it at the end. It's not father-in-law's or brother-in-law's, right? We added the S for the plural here, okay, in the first part of this noun. And then we still added the apostrophe S. So it reads, fathers-in-law's phones, okay, so the phones of the fathers-in-law's, maybe both of your father in laws, or you have a stepfather in law, new father in law, okay, whatever the situation, we're talking about more than one. Same here, brothers in laws. So maybe you have two brother in law, okay. This is the plural version for this the brothers in laws. If two people own a single item, okay, so if two people own one item, then you're going to place the apostrophe S after the second name only. Okay, so if you have two people that own one item, the apostrophe S is after the second name. But if you have individual ownership, okay, between similar items, then you're going to use an apostrophe S on both the people, or both of the nouns. So let's see what this means. Let's look at our first example. John and Mary's car is quite old, okay? So here we have two people, John and Mary, but only Mary has this apostrophe S. Why? Because we're just talking about this one car. This car belongs to both John and Mary, so that case, right, a single item between two people, we put the apostrophe S only after the second name. So John and Mary's car is quite old. This tells us they both own the car. Again here, we have Meldy and Abe's big luggage is hard to carry. Here this big luggage belongs to Abe and Meldy. So we're only going to put apostrophe S after the second name. Okay, so this sentence tells us they only have one luggage for the both of them. Now these last two examples shows us the second version, where we have two similar items belonging to each person individually. So here we have Marie's and Belle's bikes were given by their supervisor. Okay, so we're only using this word here, bikes, but we have an apostrophe S here, an apostrophe S here. Okay, so you'll notice this is plural, so we're talking about more than one bike. So that means that of these group of bikes, one belongs to Belle, and a different one belongs to Marie. Okay, so Marie and Belle's bikes were given by their supervisor. This tells us they both own bikes which were given to them. Okay, they have separate bikes. Same with this last example. Jeff's and Kelly's published books earn praise from their respective loyal fans. So here we're talking about these published books. Okay, it's plural. So we have more than one book. And we have an apostrophe S after Jeff and Kelly. So this tells us that Jeff owns his own separate published book, and Kelly owns her own separate published book, okay? They each have their own published books. 
if we had no apostrophe s here and it was just jeff and kelly's published books then that would mean to us that all of the published books belong to both jeff and kelly equally We also use apostrophes when we have a noun combined with a possessive adjective. Okay, then we're going to use this apostrophe s after the noun. So let's look at this example, make it clear. Mike's and your sandwich. Okay, Mike's and your sandwich. So your is our possessive adjective. Okay, so we have Mike's and your sandwich. Sandwich belongs to both this person, who we're referring to as your, and Mike. But remember, the apostrophe S is only used on the noun, okay? not the possessive adjective. Same with this example. His and Jennifer's colorful pens. Okay, So his and Jennifer's colorful pens. These pens belong to both of them. We have John's and my house. So we're talking about this house that belongs to John and this person referred to with my. And Catherine's and his loyal fans. So these fans belong to this person here and to Catherine. But again, only the noun will get the apostrophe S. Now, moving to a different use of apostrophes, okay, we also use apostrophes to show contraction. I'm sure many of you have seen this and used this. It's very common, okay? But just to review, a contraction okay, is when we put two words together, or words are combined, and we combine them by removing a few letters. The letters that we removed get replaced with the apostrophe as a signal that there were letters here. These are some common contractions, right? If you have do and not, do not, we contract it to don't. And you'll see, we put it together. Here's the apostrophe. The apostrophe is replacing O, right? O used to be here. Here we have should have, okay? Should have contracts into should have, right? Don't, should have, okay? We use contractions because they're easier to say. But here, we have the apostrophe. What's missing? We're missing this H and A. So, should've. Same here, won't. Combination of will and not. Apostrophe where O used to be. Your. You and R. You are. But we take out that A for the apostrophe. Okay, so your. You are much easier to say than you are. Here we have I'm, okay, apostrophes in place of the A, or I am, and could not, okay, could not contracts to couldn't, couldn't, we're taking out that O. A less common use of apostrophes, okay, is if we have some letters or numbers that we're using, that might be unclear that they are used as individual letters or numbers. Then we're going to use an apostrophe S to help tell the reader that we're using this letter or this number as an individual number. Okay, But if we're using a group of letters, we don't need an apostrophe S. So maybe that was confusing. Let's look at the examples to make it a little bit more clear. Here we have, she always forgets to capitalize her eyes, okay? So if we didn't use an apostrophe, maybe this would be just is, and it would look like is, okay? So it would be confusing to the reader. So we use this apostrophe to tell the reader that we mean just I, right? Or eyes, plural of I. Here, her zeros look like O to me, okay? If we don't use this apostrophe, then maybe to the reader, they'll be trying to figure out if it means os, 
or what is os, right? It's not clear. So we use this apostrophe to make it clear that this is, we're talking about zeros. Here we have the example, she got E's on her three subject. Again, this apostrophe makes this individual letter clear that we mean just the letter E. Same with this example, I need to get straight A's, right? So I can fit, apply for a scholarship. Without this apostrophe, okay, maybe the reader might read it as as. So these apostrophes here, very useful to distinguish this as using it as a individual letter or number. And again, we said if you have a group of letters, right? if you have a group of letters, you don't need the apostrophe S. So she never learned her ABCs, right? You, no reader is going to confuse this as something else. It's obviously the three letters ABC. So no apostrophe is needed. Okay, or here, I need to get it even if it ends with XYZs. So again, XYZ like this, very clear, not going to confuse it. We can just put an S. We don't need the apostrophe S. Now here is something that many people get confused with. Um, you'll find on the internet, people don't really follow this quite well, but it's a, nice to learn so that, you know, when you do write, you'll look professional and people will take your writing seriously because they think, oh, this person understands punctuation very well. And that is using these apostrophes when you're writing years, okay? So let's take a look at some of these examples. Here, the first one, since the 1970s, right, the Thomases made sure that their businesses would never go bankrupt. So here, we're writing out the full year. You do not need an apostrophe here, okay? You do not need an apostrophe here with the full year. This next example, the class of the 80s, received an outstanding award during the school reunion. Okay, so let's take a look here. We have no apostrophe with the S, okay? But when we abbreviated this year, I'm guessing the 1980s, right? We had this apostrophe in the front. So with the S, we are not using an apostrophe. But if we abbreviate the year, right? 1970 is the full year, but here at the 80s, we're going to use the apostrophe here. This example, it was in the mid 90s when we built our first company. Okay, so this example is a little bit different, but what do we notice? First of all, the plural, the S, has no apostrophe. Okay, and even though this is a abbreviated form of the full year, because we attached this mid to it, we don't use an apostrophe in the front. It's just mid 90s. Only when it's the abbreviation by itself like this will we use an apostrophe. Next, okay, here we have, I was very sure that the music was from the late 60s. Okay, and again here, this is the abbreviated form. We have this S here, no apostrophe. Okay, but you can use one here for the abbreviated year. All right, so here we'll go over quotation marks. Now, quotation marks are used to indicate some special material or any direct quotation, as you may know. In terms of types of quotations, there are actually two different types. You have these double quotes and these single quotes. Okay? Which ones you use depend on the style, writing style you're using, or the country that you're writing in. For example, American English will use these double quotes for their direct quotations, and then use single quotes if there is a quotation within another quotation. However, British English does the opposite. They use single quotes for their direct quotations, and double quotes for their quotation within another quotation. Okay, so there are some slight differences, 
But in general, the rules are the same, and I will try to point out when we talk about these quotation marks, when the rules are different. So the first thing we'll talk about is how to use quotation marks to set off a word-for-word -word quotation, okay, this direct quotation. In this situation, you're going to capitalize the first word in the complete quotation, if it is this word-for-word -word complete quotation, okay? So we can look at our examples here. Anna said, robots are taking over the workforce and human labor will be obsolete. Okay, so this is a long, full, direct quotation. First things you should notice is here this comma, right? After Inna said, okay, anything here you use, you'll always use this comma. Inna said, Inna announced, Inna yelled, okay? Always comma. Then your quotation. Because it is a full quotation, we capitalize this R in robot. And you'll notice at the end, the period is inside the quotation marks, okay? Don't put it outside, you're gonna put it inside. And the period being inside, okay, this is, again, this is for American quotation marks. Later we'll talk about how British quotations sometimes will have this outside, okay? But it's not too much of a big deal, so don't worry right now. This sentence, we have, what danger, she asked, okay? So here we have our quotations, question mark is inside, and hopefully you, you have listened to the lesson about question marks, but if you haven't, remember that the question, the question mark will actually replace the comma that would normally be here. Next we have, he flashed a grin and said, have we met before? Okay. So here we have the question mark is inside the quotations. We have a comma after said, and we capitalized this letter. Here we have, you may need to call a technician, just call the admin and she'll take care of it, he advised. So here, okay, we have our quotations, right? And you'll notice here that actually the quotation, the full quotation is before this tag here, he advised. So instead of ending it with a period, we actually put a comma here. And this comma is going to be inside, for American style. And then our sentence will actually end with a period over here. Okay. Now, if the quotation continues a sentence, where it's just part of the quotation, we don't have to capitalize. So here, look at our example, okay? This is a different version if we go back of our full quotation, right? Now we're just quoting parts of it. So Inna said the robots were taking over the workforce and that human labor will be obsolete. So we're just taking pieces of her quote. So we do not capitalize it here, okay? And there's no punctuation mark at the end of the quote here. Okay, the only punctuation mark will be here at the end of the sentence, and the period is inside the quotation marks. Here we have, his speech inspired me to live life fully and to never give up on my dreams. Okay, so here we're quoting only parts of it. We don't capitalize. Now we normally will use commas with direct quotations like we've been seeing, but if you have a one word quotation after the tag he said or she said or she wrote and so on, you're not gonna need a comma. So we can see here in our examples, this place is amazing, she exclaimed. Okay, so we have this comma here because this is a direct quote and we need the comma before she exclaimed here. It's inside the quotation marks. Here, where, Ken asked. Okay, so here the quotation is in front, but we still need this comma. And then we have another comma. Did you find the treasure map? Over here, he said go. Okay, here, because we only have this one word quotation, we don't need a comma here. 
But if the quotation is in front, then we will need a comma. Go, he said. Also, if you have quotations that are acting as a subject or an object within a sentence, we don't really need a comma. So here, I shouldn't have said, I'm sorry. We don't need a comma here. You don't need, I shouldn't have said, I'm sorry. It's just all part of the sentence. Again, here, this one word quotation, he said, go. Here, the idiom, blessing in disguise, means that something good is recognized at first. Okay, so here, the blessing in disguise is part of our subject. We don't need a comma. Now, periods and commas will always go inside the quotation mark for American English and U.S. English. For examples here, Marilyn wrote, I like you. The period at the end is inside the quotation. Here, the movie we saw was Bohemian Rhapsody. Okay, here, the period is inside. Go, he said. Okay, here, the comma is inside. Where, Ken asked, did you find the treasure map? Here, the comma is inside. This is for American English. For British English, the period and comma not always inside. Okay? Only if it is part of the actual quotation does it go inside. So you'll see here, no one heard when he said, I need help. Okay? We're quoting this part, I need help. But it's the actual period for the full sentence is outside the quotation. This is the British style. So take note of that if you are writing in an area that uses British English. For the American example, the period would be on the inside. Okay? Same here, right? We're talking about the comma here. Hello, he said, and hello, he said. Okay, same, just the placement of the comma. For British English, the comma is outside. American English, the comma is inside. You'll notice, though, that question marks are the same, and that is what we will talk about next. For U.S. and U.K. English, the question mark and the exclamation mark follow the same rules. Okay, so if the question mark is part of the quotation, then it is inside. But if the question mark is not part of the quotation, then it will be outside the quotation marks here. So let's look at this again. Marilyn wrote, do you like me? Okay, this quoted part, do you like me, is an actual question, right? So the question mark is part of it. So it will be inside quotation marks. But this sentence, have you seen Bohemian Rhapsody? Okay, this is a question. This full sentence here is a question. But the actual quoted part, we're just using quotation marks for the name Bohemian Rhapsody. So this is not, the question mark is not part of this Bohemian Rhapsody. So the question mark will be outside. Here we have another sentence. Can you believe it? He has never heard of Queen. Okay, so here we're just quoting the name Queen. But Queen isn't used with an exclamation, right? It's not Queen, right? It's just Queen. So the exclamation point is part of the full phrase here, so it is outside. Same with this sentence. How dare he call me? Mother Princess. Okay? The name Mother Princess doesn't have an exclamation as part of it. But this full sentence is the exclamation sentence, so the exclamation is on the outside. Now, when you quote titles of work, there are different versions of work that will be quoted and that will not be quoted. So here we have a list of things that you will use quotation marks with. So poem names, stories, essays, okay, song names, chapter titles, magazines or newspaper articles, the individual episodes of a television series, and a p individual page of a website. These will all be written with quotation marks around them. But these items are written in italic. 
form. Okay, they do not use quotations. So if you are writing the name of a collection of poetry or stories or essays, you write that in italics. Okay, if you're writing the title of the book, you write that in italics or a title of a CD or tapes or records that is in italics. Okay, magazines and newspapers can be written in italics. Television and radio shows will be written in italics. Okay, the name of place and the title of an entire website will be written in italics. So you can go back, right, and compare. Okay? Normally, it's the individual works that are written in quotation, right? So like the chapter title is in quotation, but the book title is in italics, okay? Or the magazine or newspaper article is in quotations, but the magazine name, okay, the bigger part, is in italics. Okay? Or same with these ones. The episodes in quotations, but the name of the TV show in italics. All right, now here we just go over how to use quotations within another quotation. And this will be a little different for both American and British English, but for American English, okay, we'll use single quotations if we have to write a quotation inside another quotation. And for British English, it's just the opposite. So here, these are all in American style. So we can see here, I don't like people who casually say, I love you without sincerity. Okay, so let's break this down. You can see we have the double quotes on the outside of our full quotation. But then here we have another quote within, and we use single quotes to distinguish this one. Okay, that's all you have to do. Pretty simple. Um, you can see here we have this comma, right? We know about this comma after, before said Mike, and it's inside the quotation marks. Okay, if British English just change the style of marks. It would be single quotations out here and double quotations on the inside. Here we have Marion replied, I entered a building which had a poster that read, enter at your own risk. Okay, so this is a useful sentence to look at because here you can see, right, we have our quotation. And then the quotation inside starts here, enter at your own risk. But this is useful so you know how to write if this situation ever comes up, where it's at the end. The quotation within is at the end of your quotation. You can see we have the double quotation here, and then the single quotation here, and then the period inside. So this is how you write it if your quotation within a quotation is at the end of the full quotation. You have a double quotation, single quotation, period. Next example, Danny told me, Hannah said, this will never work. Okay, so here we have the same situation. We have our full quote here, but then our quotation within a quotation is at the end, so we have a double quote, single quote, and period inside. This next sentence, he asked, did Hannah really say it's not allowed to sleep in the office? Okay, here's another useful sentence because we have our full quotation here with double quotes, our quotation inside here, okay? And you can see now that because we're using a question mark and the question mark is not part of our full, I mean, not part of our quotation within a quotation, that that question mark is outside the single quote, but it's inside the double quote because it's part of this full quotation. Okay, so don't get confused with where these punctuation marks wind up. In our last example, I read the poem Frozen in Bliss yesterday. Okay, this one pretty simple, right? We have our quotation within single quotes double quotes, and then the comma inside the double quotes. And there are other rare uses, okay, not rare, but not as common as 
using quotations like we just looked at. And for example, when you're writing about letters or certain words, okay, you can use quotation marks to refer to a specific word or letter. So here, in the previous sentence, apple was properly spelled with two P's. Okay, so you can see how we use these quotations for the P and for apple, okay, to know that these two are related. You can use it for translations if you want. Okay? You can see here, his knowledge of Spanish is limited to gracias, thank you, and adios, goodbye. Okay? So we use these quotations for these translations, but parentheses can be used. Okay? You can use other terms too, or other punctuation marks that we will learn about for translations, but this is just one option. Okay? And make sure you do use commas when you have translations like this. Something called scare quotes or sneer quotes, okay? which are used to cast doubt on some word or phrase, okay? can be used in quotation marks. So for example, he often spoke of his job that he does at home. Okay, so here we're using quotations for job because we're trying to mean that it's not really a job, right? We're trying to say, oh, his job. Okay, it's not really a job. He calls it, maybe he calls it a job, but everyone knows it's not really a job. Okay, so here it explains his job was holding letters for his mom. Okay, it's not a job. So this is a type of scare quote or sneer quote where you're casting doubt on someone. He often spoke of his job, okay? and many people, when they're talking and doing this, they'll put their hands up and do quotation signs. You'll see that sometimes. And also we can use quotations for nicknames. Okay? So if you have a nickname, you can put that nickname in quotation marks. Jerry the Bear Smith, right? His name is in quotations here. All right, here we have parentheses. Parentheses are mainly used to mark additional information within a sentence. And the material is inserted in a sentence, it could be a word, fragment, or even more sentences. So let's look at some of the ways we use these. The first main way is to use parentheses to clarify or add information. Okay, so we will enclose additional information to clarify the meaning of the text. This can be non-essential or essential to the meaning. Let's look at these examples. He told the students, after thinking for five minutes, that they could visit the zoo after the trip to the museum. Okay, so this extra part here, it's not essential, right? We don't need this in here. We could just read, he told the students that they could visit the zoo after the trip to the museum. But we add this extra information just to give the reader a clear idea. All teachers must wear their uniform. Refer to handbook page 15. Okay, so here we're using it a little different. Here we're using it after the sentence, and it's to give extra clear instruction. The association will be here next week, August 3rd. Okay, now again here it's inside the sentence, and we're giving more information to clarify the text. The government, under democratic rule, will aid the rural hospitals. Now, a period is placed only inside the parentheses, okay, if this element enclosed is a complete sentence. If the enclosed sentence is part of the main sentence, then you remove the period. But let's see what this looks like. Make sure to visit Ocean Park. You'll be amazed. Okay, so here the enclosed information is a separate full sentence, so we have this period. But this version, make sure to visit Ocean Park. You'll be amazed. Okay, this is included within the main sentence. So the period is not here, we only have one period, and that's after everything. 
Let's take a look at this one. I met the main actor in my favorite TV series. It was an awesome experience. Okay, so this is separate from the main sentence, and it's a full sentence. So we have this period here afterwards. Not outside, it's inside still. My phone, my auntie gave me on my birthday, got lost at school. Okay, so this is within the main sentence. So we don't have a period here. Parentheses, or the information in the parentheses, don't count as part of the subject. So what does that mean, and why is that important? Let's look at these examples. James and his sisters is planning to travel next month. Okay, so many people might think, wait a second, it's James and his sisters, so this should be R. But they're in parentheses, and parentheses are never part of the subject. So it's James and his sisters is planning to travel next month. Okay, this is just extra information. It's not going to alter our verb. My friend Jason, accompanied by his sisters, has received my invitation last week. Okay, again, this is not part of the subject. If it was part of the subject, we would have to change this to have. But we're just talking about Jason. My friend Jason has, right? This is just extra information. Jeremy, with his company, will fly to Iraq tomorrow. The chief officer, together with his members, is implementing a new law. Okay, again, without parentheses, maybe we'd have to change this to R. But because it's in parentheses, this is the only subject. Parentheses normally are followed by a comma okay, and not before them. So what does that mean? Okay. When he left, it was already raining. His mom called me. Since I have lots of potatoes given by my friends, I will try to bake them tonight. Okay, so you see, the parentheses are before the comma. We don't put this part after the comma. The extra information is coming before the comma. Because of the movie Sp Spider-Man, my son asked me to buy him a similar costume. Okay? It wouldn't be because of the movie, comma, Spider-Man. It has to be before this comma. When the man was convicted because of theft, his family could not do anything but cry. All right. For this punctuation mark, we're talking about braces. Now braces, you won't use too often when writing, but in case you do, I wanted to cover it just so you know how to use them. The first use for braces, or for a brace, is to indicate number sets. Okay? So what is a number set? Well, it's just a list or a series of continuous whole numbers, and they're going in the upward direction. So here we have, you know, different numbers, but as you can see, they're all going in an increase, right? They're going in an upward direction. And we use these braces to enclose them. Very simple. Okay, now another use for the brace, or for using braces, is to show choices that you're talking about within your sentence. Okay, so let's look at our examples to make this clear. Once you finish picking your dish, pork, chicken, fish, make sure you choose your dessert. So here we enclose it in these braces to show that these are choices for the dish. Okay, so it gives, it's a way of giving extra information without making the sentence too long or too complicated. So it's very useful. Okay, so once you finish picking your dish, pork, chicken, fish, make sure you choose your dessert. And we can do it with numbers too. So among the numbers 4, 8, 10, 14, which is your least favorite? Here again, choose one fruit, apple, orange, strawberry, okay, then present it to your friends. So again, these are all choices that are talked about within the sentence. And we'll read the last one. Let the kids choose the juice. 
orange, pineapple, watermelon, pears. Okay, so very easy to use. Um, as you can see, we can still use regular punctuation within the braces, after the braces, right? Here we have it within the period. So very easy to use and nice way to add information to our sentences. For this lesson, we'll be covering brackets. Brackets are used mainly for clarification, okay, to make something very clear. So if you have some item, okay, that is in your text that is maybe not clear or is confusing, then we can add this extra information using these brackets. We'll use the examples to make this understood. Our first one, he shook his hands with her daughter. Maddie. Okay, so here we have these brackets, right? This is a bracket, this is a bracket. So let's first read the sentence without the bracket information. It would be, he shook his hands with Maddie. Okay, if we only wrote that, then it leads or it leaves an unclear state, right? Who is Maddie? We don't know. Sure, we could add an extra sentence afterwards, but that's a lot of writing, okay, it's extra, we don't need it. So to make our writing more concise, more clear, we're gonna use these brackets to add that information in there. So he shook his hands with her daughter, Maddie, okay? And when you're reading this, you can read this uh, sort of like there's a comma here, like a pause. So he shook his hands with her daughter, Maddie. And sometimes when you're reading out loud, you don't have to read the bracketed part. You can leave it out. So he shook his hands with Maddie. And then you can read it silently and know, oh, Maddie is her daughter. Here we have, the reporter will have a meeting with Mr. Ernie James. And we've added this extra information, CEO of a popular magazine. Right? So these brackets are just extra information. They don't have to be read. If we wanted them to be read 100%, right? If 100% we wanted them to be read aloud, then we would use something else maybe like a comma, right? We would use commas here. And then guaranteed they're read aloud. But in these brackets like this, they don't have to be read aloud. It can just be seen as extra information. Here we have this next example sentence. The year we built our company, 1989, made a long, winding road to us. Our next example, Claire would never make a deal with joy. Okay, so we don't have to read it. If you want to read it, you can. Or you can just look at it and say, oh, joy is her colleague. Another use for brackets is, again, for giving information Okay, but not necessarily because it's confusing or to clear something up, but for unknown words, right? So maybe in translations, you're using a foreign language within your own language or within English. So our example here, the boss usually says, Kalao Proi. Okay, I don't know if I'm saying that 100% correct, but this is a foreign language, right? It's not English. So to let the reader know what this means without them having to go look it up, we use these brackets to tell them, oh, good morning. I see these brackets next to the word. I know this is the meaning of this. Okay, so these are good for unknown words. Let's go through these examples. I tried to talk to a Chinese guy, but he kept on giving me these words. I'm not going to say this correctly, but wu bu Jidao, okay, and then in brackets, I don't know. Okay, so in Chinese, this means I don't know. Here we have the Filipino advertisement today had these words, mahal kita, okay, which apparently means I love you, okay, but we use these brackets to tell the reader the translation. 
the guy from Malaysia said, Salamat Malam, or good evening to me last night. Okay. And again, because these are in brackets, when you're reading aloud, you don't have to read this information. It's extra information. It's your choice to read it aloud or to continue the sentence without reading it. It's up to you. We can also use brackets to add missing words. Okay, so many writers, okay, when you write, you'll think about your sentence in your head, but when you actually write it, you omit some of the words. Okay, this happens quite often. So if another writer, okay, is using a different writer's work, and they want to include it in their own, and they notice there's a word missing, well then, when they rewrite it, they can use these brackets to show that originally this was missing, but it should be here. Okay? So I bought a small book from the National Bookstore. Here, the letter, or the word, I guess, A, is in a bracket, and that tells us that originally this was missing. Okay? But the correct thing is it should be here, so we've included it, but we put these brackets to tell you that we have included it afterwards. Let's go through the rest of the examples. A lady with pink ribbon waved her hands to me. Okay, and again, these brackets mean originally this was not here. She should give me an exact copy of her documents. Okay, so here, the brackets tell us this was not originally written. And the company booked a meeting with their competitors. Now we can also use brackets to help signify or show some type of emphasis. Okay, so this is when you're a writer mostly. Okay, you're gonna to wanna to add emphasis to your writing Okay, to set things apart. So if you want to add emphasis in your idea or your quote, first you're going to italicize the word or phrase that needs to have emphasis added. Okay, and then at the end of the sentence, in brackets, you're going to write emphasis added. So let's look at how this is done. She shortly announced that this dish would look presentable. So here, presentable is in italics, and afterwards, you have emphasis added. So that tells me that I need to read this word here, presentable, with emphasis. So she shortly announced that this dish would look presentable. Okay, you add some emphasis to it. Our next example, the interviewer highlighted that all of us must be vigilant whenever we plan our travels. Okay, so we have this emphasis added here. So wherever the italicized word is, that is where we add the emphasis. Okay, so it's hard to see, okay, but here is italicized. So the interview highlighted that all of us must be vigilant. Okay, you add this emphasis, all of us must be vigilant whenever we plan our travels. So that phrase, that section that's italicized, gets the emphasis. The next one, the manager asked his employees if someone took the box and kept it hidden. Okay, so again, here hidden is italicized, and we have this phrase, this term here in brackets to mean emphasized, emphasis, so hidden has to be emphasized, okay? You say it with some extra emotion, extra voice. Down here as well, the traffic enforcer made a litany, drive carefully, and look around all the time, okay? So here, carefully and look around are in italics, okay? Maybe hard to tell. And we have this emphasis added, so it should read drive carefully and look around all the time. Okay? So here is how you can 
add emphasis or signal emphasis should be added in your writing. Now we can also use brackets to hide some type of content, okay? Maybe it's not good or it's offensive. So let's look at these examples to see how we used it. You should give me a, and then here we have expletive. Expletive means uh, inappropriate word, curse word maybe, and then followed by good reason, okay? So for example, if you're writing something that will be shown to public okay, or to many people. Maybe you have to edit it to take certain words out. You can replace those bad words like this okay, in these brackets with the word expletive. Now brackets can also be used as an alternative for parenthesis or within a parenthesis. Okay, so let's look at how we will do this. Okay, um, this is not common. Normally, parentheses are used more commonly, okay? But sometimes you have to use both, and we'll see how it helps make it more clear. So the guy is proposing to her, okay? And then here we have, they love each other, for sure. So here we have three levels of information, okay? That is why we're using parentheses and brackets. We have three different levels of information. The first level of information is here. The guy is proposing to her. That is the first level. Then we wanted to add extra information. So we use these parentheses and we included they love each other. And now we're adding an extra level of information here for sure. Okay. So you see how we added three levels of information. And we broke the first one apart with parentheses and the third one apart here with these brackets. Okay, let's look at the next one. They have been staying here for quite some time. It was like 10 years ago, 1995. So again, we have different levels or different layers of information. So here is this first basic one, right? They have been staying here for quite some time. Then in parentheses, we added, it was like 10 years ago, okay? And then we added even more information in these brackets to be very exact, to tell them the exact year, 1995. And the same follows with these examples. He usually goes out with his colleagues from his new company, BPO, okay? So here's the first layer of information. He usually goes out with his colleagues. Then we added from his new company, and then in brackets here, even more specific, the company name is BPO. And our final example, he visited lots of universities, wrote a research on linguistics, and then more information the year 2017. Okay, But we use these brackets to add another layer after we've already used parentheses. Okay. Let's learn about the hyphen. Now the hyphen is just a punctuation mark mainly used to join words together. And as you can see, it's just this little short horizontal line, okay, similar to a dash, but don't get confused, it is different than a dash, and we don't separate with spaces. And again, hyphens might look like dashes, but they are used differently. Okay, think of a hyphen as something that will glue two or more words together, while the dash separates words to make things clear or stand out more. Well, the first use of this hyphen is to make compound modifiers before nouns, okay, or compound adjectives, if you will. So we use this hyphen to make these compound modifiers that come before this noun. You can see here in these examples, an off-site meeting. Okay, so we use this hyphen to join the word off and site together to make this compound adjective, okay? An off-site meeting. 
a well-known scientist. The 40-year-old man. So you can see, even with more than two words, we can link them together with these hyphens. A brown-eyed girl. If the compound adjective comes after the noun, many times you don't need a hyphen, right? It will change the way you write the sentence and the word. So the meeting is off-site. The scientist is well-known. The man is 40 years old. Okay, so if you write it in this structure, you're not going to have to use these hyphens, whereas you put it in front of the noun. We use hyphens for compound numbers. So when numbers are expressed as a compound, we hyphenate them. 48, 99, 67. Okay? So basically, we're always going to hyphenate numbers when you are describing a compound number between the numbers of 21 and 99. Okay? And obviously, the series of 10s, 30, 40, 50, you don't hyphenate because it's just one word. And then once you get past 99, you don't need a hyphen. Okay, it's just these numbers between 21 and 99. We also use hyphens to avoid confusing word combinations. All right? So if you combine words, they could create a different meaning. So we use a hyphen to avoid this confusion. For example, here, recreate, okay, and recreate. Okay, many times, you'll find it written like this, even though they mean this version. So you have to be careful. This one, not too bad. Recreate, with a hyphen, means to make again, to create again. But here, this recreate is a very rare verb that means to amuse or to make fun but it's not used often in that term so even if you see it like this people might see it as recreate but to be extra clear okay you can use this hyphen so recreate like i said it means relax and enjoy okay to restore you know recreation kind of but recreate means to create again. So you can see how this can be confusing if you mean one thing even though you left the hyphen out. Another common problem is these two words, re-sign and resign. Okay? I made this mistake myself once. I wanted to re-sign my contract at work, but in my email I forgot the hyphen, so they called me asking me why I'm quitting. And I couldn't understand what they were talking about. And then I realized I forgot the hyphen. So you have to be careful. Resign means to sign again. And resign means to quit. So these hyphens are very important. You're going to use a hyphen after a prefix with a proper noun or proper adjective. Okay, so here we have these prefixes mid and pre. And they're before these proper nouns, okay, or these proper adjectives, July, Victorian. So we need this hyphen here. And you'll also use hyphen for some of the prefixes, including all, x, and self. Okay, so all-knowing, ex-wife self-propelled. So you need these hyphens. If you want to separate a word to show that it, it has different syllables, we can use a hyphen to do that. Right? So reference. Reference. These are their syllables. If you've learned about syllables, you'll know what these are. Right? These are the sounds within the word. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, we hyphenate to separate the syllables.
We also use hyphens when forming original compound verbs. Okay, so verbs that aren't normally used that have been created and are compound. So double click, right? Nowadays, double click is a very common verb. Okay, double click the icon. But double and click without the hyphen might sound confusing. So we put it together to make it sound or seem like one verb. So the supervisor sweet talked them into working. Again, this hyphen connects these two words to make a compound verb. I air conditioned the room of our baby. Okay, again, I air conditioned. That's not a normal verb, but by using this hyphen, we can make it this compound verb. And we use hyphens to show single entities of a compound noun. So tomorrow is my mother-in-law birthday, right? So we use these hyphens for mother-in-law or birds of prey, higher ups, check-in, passerby, red orange, laughing gas. Okay, when we're talking about a unique entity, a single entity making these compound nouns. And we also use hyphens when writing age expressions, okay? But there are some rules. So the basic rule is to use hyphens when writing about years, months, or any other period of time, okay? unless the time expressions are plural. So years, months, weeks, and days, we don't use hyphens. So we can look at these examples. I have a six-year-old son, okay? So the six-year-old son, we hyphenate this here similar to those compound adjectives we made. I have a six-year-old is fine as well, okay? But with no hyphens, my son is six years old. Okay, so we rewrote it a little bit, and now you can see that years is plural, but we don't have any hyphens here. It's only when it's singular like this, six-year-old son, but six years old, not hyphenated. But here we have some exceptions. My son is one year old. My son is one month old. Okay, these are singular, but we don't hyphenate them. So for one year, or one month, or one day, we're not gonna hyphenate. But anything above one, we will hyphenate. Three-year-old daughter, 10-year-old students. All right, let's take a look at a punctuation mark called the dash. Now, there are two types of dash, something called an n dash and an m dash. Okay, n dash and m dash. You'll see the difference here is the length. The n dash is much shorter than the m dash. Okay, now, Unfortunately, if you're typing, there's not an, just one key you can press to get these types of punctuation. So I've included how to type them or use them on Windows and Mac. Okay, if you have some other operating system, you can easily look it up. But for Windows, for M dash, okay, you just hold down the Alt key and type 0151 and then release the Alt key. For M dash, same thing, hold the Alt key but you type 0150 and release the Alt key. For Mac, okay, a little different. For M dash, hold down the Shift and Option keys, and then press the minus key. Okay, or a different way, you can press the hyphen key twice and press space. For N dash, hold down the Option key and just press the minus key. So the n dash, okay, when do we use this n dash? Well, the n dash is a dash that indicates a span of dates or time or numbers, okay? Think of it kind of like and or to. So let's look at some examples to see how we can use it. The teacher told us to review units 11 through 8 for the test, okay, or 11 
to 18 for the test, right? When you see that dash, you can think of to or and or through, right? but you'll see here, this is an end dash. And before and after the end dash, there's no space, okay, when you type your numbers. The next example, we regularly hold meetings every Tuesday, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Again, here we're using this dash, okay, no spaces before and after. The Zhao Dynasty, 1046 to 256 BC, okay, here's the dash, no spaces, surplanted the Shang and introduced the concept of the mandate of heaven to justify their rule. This toy is not suitable for ages 3 to 5, okay, again, we're joining these numbers, okay, it's a range, and no spaces. If you include the actual word, then you don't also include the end dash, right? It's either or. Either you write the word to or and, or you take that word out and you use the end dash. Okay, and again, as you can see, we've used the end dash to report scores or results, right? So here, the class voted two to three to uphold the decision. This is the result of the vote, two people to three people. Okay. Paradise has only played one other game to date, losing seven to one. This is the score, right? The score of the game. Again here, Feldian's green sleeves grab a one to zero lead. This is the score, it's a span, right? The final vote tally Thursday was 231, to 199. This is the result. One result was here, one result was here. Okay, it's not continuous. We can also use n dash to show relationships or connections. So let's look at our first example. We have a good mother daughter relationship. Here we have this connection, right? This mother daughter relationship. We're using the end dash. Okay. Cheyenne Stokes' respiration is an abnormal pattern of breathing. Okay, so this these two words have a relationship. They're linked together. So we use this end dash to show that. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, right? So here, okay, this is a compound word, right? We're joining these two words together with this end dash. There's a relationship. I found a website where you can book cheaper Vancouver to Ontario flights. Okay, this is related. Vancouver, Ontario flights. So let's quickly talk about something called compound adjectives. Our end dash is often used in place of a hyphen Okay, in these compact, compound adjectives, when one or both elements is itself an open compound or a hyphenated compound. So that might be confusing. Let's break these down to see what exactly that means. So here we have the first one, a nursing home home care policy. So here we have two words that are related, home care, and nursing home. These nursing home is a compound adjective. Home care is a compound adjective. And we are joining it with this end dash. Okay. So again, the end dash will replace the hyphen okay, when you're using these open compounds. So this is a policy about the nursing home and home care. A nursing home home care policy. The next example, this article is biased against non-English native teachers. Okay, so this article is biased against non-English native teachers, is how it should be read. This article is biased against non-English native teachers. So here, English native 
is a compound adjective with a hyphen, right? It's a hyphenated compound. So to link it to this non, we're going to use an n dash so that it's not confusing. Here we have the pre Civil War years. Okay, Civil War is an hyphenated or sorry, not hyphenated, open compound. It is an open compound, and we'll use this n dash okay, to link pre to this open compound. Next we have the m dash. Okay, now we're moving on to the m dash. The m dash, or if you will most commonly use it as a pair of m dashes, okay, can be in place of commas for better readability or for emphasis. Okay, so to make things more clear, so you can see here, the food, which was delicious, reminded me of home. Okay, so these long lines, these are m dashes. And if you took the comma lesson already, you'll know that you could also just use commas here to set this information apart. But here, it makes it stand out. It's much more clear. I called Mr. Murray, my son's swimming coach, at school yesterday. Again, these m dashes are setting this information apart. Four of us, Nina, Selena, Sean, and I, went to the beach last week. The question words, who, what, when, where, why, and how, are often very confusing to foreign language learners. Okay, so again, we can use these m dashes instead of commas, and the purpose is for better readability, right? Makes it look more clear, stands out. We can also use m dashes instead of parentheses, okay? So these are all optional. You have the choice. Depends on the writing style or the writing that you're trying to come across with. Three alkali metals, sodium, potassium, and lithium, are the usual substituents. So here, we're just using these N dashes, the M dashes, to replace what would have been parentheses, okay? When an N dash is unavailable in a particular character encoding environment, as in the ASC2 character set, there are some conventional substitutions. Okay, again, these M dashes are replacing the parentheses. Please call my secretary, Alice Kim, on Monday. Okay, and you'll notice some of these situations could be commas, parentheses, or M dash. Okay, you have some options. While I was shopping, window shopping actually, I ran into an old schoolmate. We can also use the M dash in place of a colon. Okay, so you'll notice that the M dash is just an alternative to many of the other punctuation marks, just for clear writing. Okay, many times if you use parentheses and colons, Things get kind of jumbled together, it's hard to read, but when you're using these M dashes, things are very clearly separated. So here we go, red and white. These are the colors of the Japanese flag, right? Normally, you could use a colon here, or in this case, we'll use the M dash. There's only one rule in this house, respect others. I love all kinds of music except Rao. Reports, photocopies, groceries, cleaning. There's so much to do, but little time. Okay, again, all of these are situations where we could use a colon, but here they chose instead to use the M dash to make things clearer. The M dash is also used to indicate an interruption okay, or abrupt change in speaking. So here we have, I have something to tell you. No, never mind. Okay, so this M dash is a sudden change of thought 
Well, I have something to tell you. This M dash means, oh, wait. Never mind. Okay. Or, you're kidding. Okay, the M dash here means they were interrupted. Something happened. It was amazing. We even saw okay, something happened. They are interrupted. So we use this M dash. Okay, I'll do it. Or you do it, right? M dash, abrupt change. Suddenly changed their idea. The M dash can also indicate missing parts or missing portions of text, okay? And in this situation, you can use multiple M dashes depending on the missing portion. So here we have, it was alleged that K, okay, and then this is the rest of their name, has been taken out for some reason, and they indicate that it's, there was something here by using the M dash, okay? She hesitated for a moment, then he shouted, do it or I'll, okay? And they don't want you to know what he said, so they use this M dash. I heard my seven-year-old saying the, okay, here the F -m word, so this is a bad word. They took out the bad part, but kept the F so you knew what it was. The offender, okay, they took out their name with the M dash, was a notorious juvenile delinquent. We can use M dash to set off words or phrases or after an independent clause. So here, a penny saved is a penny earned. Okay, that's a sentence, and then we have an M dash to set off some information. Benjamin Franklin. Okay. Spring is passing, the birds cry, and the fishes fill with tears on their eyes. M dash, Matsubashu. Okay, we're adding just some information to a independent clause. Ah, Jake, Mrs. Johnson exclaimed, how you've grown to such a fine lad. Okay, so here we're adding this information, this quotation from Mrs. Johnson. Here, the pre-Civil War years, 1820 to 1860, or the antebellum years, were among the most chaotic in American history. And then they added some extra information by using this M dash, a time of significant changes that took place as the United States change of age, came of age. So here, right, we're using it after this independent clause. Okay, here we're going to learn about the very useful, but very easy to use, ellipsis. So ellipsis, or ellipses, okay, for plural, is just a punctuation mark of three dots like this, or three periods, one, two, three, okay? And it indicates some type of omission, means we took something out. There was something there, but we took it out. Okay, so this helps us save space. Um, by taking out less relevant information. So, we can omit information from the beginning of a sentence. Okay? You start with an ellipsis, and then you bracket the next word, or the first word's letter, with a capital letter. So let's look. Here we have dot dot dot, that's our ellipsis. Whenever they meet, it's always on a rainy day, okay? So this, these ellipsis, these three dots, mean that we took out the beginning part of this sentence. And this is actually still part of that same sentence. You can see here, this is the original sentence. It's strange that whenever they meet, it's always on a rainy day, okay? But they wrote it like this to get rid of some of that sentence. And you have to capitalize in brackets, like this, the first letter. 
also here. Okay, Before they even made plans, he had already decided. These dots tell us there was more to the sentence. For example here, no one had any travel ideas or which country to visit, but before they even made plans, he had already decided to go solo. Okay, so they took out all of this first part because not needed. And then they just started the sentence from here. But they have to capitalize that first letter in brackets. And these brackets tell us with the ellipse that it's part of a full sentence. Okay, and again, we can use this ellipsis to take out any redundant or irrelevant words in a sentence. So let's look here. The original sentence may have been, I've never been so happy in my entire life. This is the first time. It's all because of you. Okay? That's a lot of words kind of saying the same thing. So we can use ellipsis to make it simpler. I've never been so happy in my entire life. It's all because of you. These ellipsis are in place of this is the first time. Okay, We're taking that out. Or here we have an extra very long piece of text, right? Everyone is unique. It is cliche, but true. No two persons are exactly the same. Okay, it goes on and on and on. So we can take parts of this out. Normally you'll take out the parts that aren't important, and you'll replace them with an ellipsis. So you can see this very long, this much shorter now. But the main idea should still be there. Again, okay, same situation. We have very long text, but we're going to take out parts of the text and replace it with the ellipsis. This gives you a shorter version, but the main idea, the main important facts are still told or revealed. A different way we can use ellipsis is to show hesitation or suspense or some type of change of mood or thoughts. So let's look at these examples. I'm not sure, but maybe. Okay, so you see how I paused? That's because of these ellipses. It's showing some hesitation. Or what do you mean by that, right? These ellipses add some type of emphasis or change in the way the sentence comes across. I'm really sorry, I was just trying to help. I didn't know that. Okay, so these pauses are from these ellipses. An average girl, you may call me, or perhaps a little bit below average. So you can see that the way I read it with these ellipses is I added hesitation, pause. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about how to use ellipsis with other punctuation marks, such as question marks or exclamation points. So you can see here, what were you? Ellipsis, where did you go? Okay, so we're taking out information between these two sentences. But the question mark stays the same, okay? Where were you? Ellipsis question mark where did you go okay so now this says that we're taking out information within the first question how could you ellipsis stop being so mean okay here we're using exclamation ellipsis and you'll see capital letter that means we took out some type of information between these two sentences he dares to call me Okay, so the ellipsis within this exclamation mark means that we took out some information before in this sentence. Okay, now with commons, commas and semicolons, I gave him the key, okay, comma, and the portal has been opened. So within this full sentence, the ellipsis comes after the comma. We're taking out some information here. 
I gave him the key. There's semicolon. Okay, the portal has been opened. We're taking out the information here. He would go to bars, comma, ellipsis, and return home tired. Okay, we're taking out this information here. He would go to bars, ellipsis, semicolon, then he returns home tired. Okay, so the main thing to look at here is just how we write ellipsis with other forms of punctuation. Okay, the spacing is still there, the three dots, that's what you want to pay attention to. In this lesson, we are going to talk about three punctuation marks that are very commonly used incorrect. That is IE, etc., and EG. First, let's go over the definition of these three terms. IE, okay, which means it est. In common English, that means that is, basically. So, or in other words, etc., which is etc., how we say it normally, means and so on and so forth. And eg in the old language is exlimpili gratia, and it means for instance or for example. Okay, so when you use these words, try not to think of the old Latin phrases. Think of what it would mean in common English. So, i.e., more like that is, or in other words, etc., means and so on and so forth. And e.g. means for instance or for example. All right, let's take a look at how we use i.e. Okay, now, this abbreviation, we use it when you want to specify or name some information that you previously gave or mentioned. And this helps the context become clear so you don't get confused. Let's look at these examples to see how it works. One of the students, i.e. Jonathan, received an appreciation award from the city government. Okay, now remember, when we write i.e., we can think of it as that is, or in other words. So you can just read it like that. One of the students, that is Jonathan, or in other words, Jonathan, okay? And if it makes sense, then you're probably using it right. I want to point out something here, and that is this comma that you'll see after the IE, okay? Now, for IE and EG, the comma after is a style choice. So you will see i.e. with a comma after or without a comma, depending on the style that the writer is using. And generally, and not always, but generally, American style uses the comma after i.e. and e.g. And British writing, or British English, does not use the comma afterwards. Okay, so I don't want you to wonder why sometimes you see a comma, sometimes you don't. Okay, it's just a style issue, and you'll learn which one you should use depending on what you're writing for. Okay, but either way, using IE is the same. Let's look at another example. I brought my favorite dish with me, i.e. Filipino chicken adobo. Okay, or that is Filipino chicken adobo, or in other words, Filipino chicken adobo. Okay, so switch out the IE for that is, or in other words, to make sure your sentence makes sense. We were alerted by our customers about the issues that our new shoes have, i.e. the red paint which fades easily. In other words, the red paint which fades easily. The carpenter, i.e. our neighbor, asked for a job at our furniture stop, shop. Okay, so this is IE, very easy to use. And again, the comma after the IE is going to be based on the style that you're writing with, 
American English, British English. So here is EG, okay? And again, here I chose to use it without the comma, just so you can see the difference. But again, depending on the place you're using, you're writing for, or the country you live in, you can use a comma, or you cannot use a comma. But EG, let's learn about how we use it, or why we use it. Remember, in Latin, it's exempli gratia, okay? This means, for example. So this is used when you want to introduce examples to the readers. Let's look at our first example. The school holds a variety of events, e.g. gymnastics, swimming, basketball, and soccer, okay? So you can see here, just E period, G period. And again, you can have a comma or you cannot have a comma. It just depends on the style. Big companies, e.g. Windows and Apple, surprise their customers with their new product features. Again, E period, G period, okay? Maybe you can have a comma here if you want. You don't need it. The students were asked to think of any writing projects, e.g. writing essays and interviewing people, okay? So again, if you want to check if you're using it right, replace it with, for example. So the students were asked to think of any writing projects, for example, writing essays and interviewing people. Communication involves many processes, e.g. input and output or, for example, input and output. Next we have etc. Okay, so etc. It's also Latin from et and cetera. Okay, et means an and cetera means the rest. But we abbreviate it when we write it to etc and then a period. So we use etc to start a list that will not be completed, which means there are many other things besides what you have written. So here we have our examples. Make sure that kids will eat vegetables, carrots, cabbage, etc. Okay, so etc. means, you know, all of the vegetables. I don't have to write them. But pay attention to how we use it, right? We have this comma here, and then it's just etc, and then a dot, okay? Here, there's only one dot at the end. If we go back, right, EG has a dot between each letter, and so does IE. So here, etc., just the letters and then the dot. Let's take a look at this example. The school will provide stationaries like pencils, paper, etc. Okay, and that means other things, books, pens, crayons, right? But again, there's ETC and the period. I like to watch football, basketball, etc. My garden has roses, sunflowers, tulips, etc. And just some things to pay attention to, okay? Um, a period is necessary to end each of these, right? X or EX is seldom used as examples, and it might mean exercise in certain academic context. Okay, so sometimes you might see this EX and it means example, but mostly you'll see these three terms. 